We'll begin the Catechism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost has instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Sorrowful in a back heart of Mary, pray, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray, pray for us. Saint Angela, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So here at the seminary of Our Lady Mount Carmel, we continue our catechism series. Um, now we're in the middle of the Ten Commandments. The Commandments, we've already seen the first three, which pertain to God directly. Now we're looking at four through ten that deal with the love of our neighbor. The love of God and the love of our neighbor are the summary of all the law and the prophets. So the fifth commandment, precisely then, what is it? Thou shalt not kill. Fifth commandment. Killing, which is forbidden by this commandment, means taking the life of a human being unjustly. Animals. What about killing animals? Animals may be killed for man's reasonable need or convenience. Hunting, fishing, and using animals for scientific purposes are permissible. To kill or injure animals without a good reason is sinful, but it is not a violation of this commandment. What are we commanded by the fifth commandment? By the fifth commandment we are commanded to take proper care of our own spiritual and bodily well-being well and that of our neighbor. So the fifth commandment commands take care of the spiritual life. This is primary that is, live in the state of grace. A man who doesn't live in the state of grace is like a walking cadaver. His soul is dead, but his body is alive. So we want to live in the state of grace, and we need to do that with God's help only. Frequent confession, frequent communion, daily prayer, daily spiritual reading. This is all part of taking care of one's spiritual life. That is a priority above the body. But the body is not to be excluded as well, because since there's many quotes in Scripture about uh, take care of the needy, take care of the poor, but, but, but despise not thy own flesh. So the, the body also has a place in um, this commandment, obviously. So that regards a sufficient food, sufficient sleep, sufficient shelter. What what? Man does not have supreme dominion over his own life. It's very important because the modern world says I have a right to do what I want with my body. That's not true at all. God is, we must fit into God's order because everything, as Proverbs says, is made for the glory of God. So we don't, no man has a right to take his own life or the life of another unjustly, unjustly. We'll come to that. Man does not have supreme dominion over his own life. He was not the cause of its beginning, nor may he be the deliberate cause of its end, to end one's life. Man must use the ordinary means to preserve life. He is not, however, obliged to use extraordinary means, which would involve relatively great expense or intolerable pain or shame. So he's talking about in the case of extraordinary means to preserve life. So, um, but even, even today, such as, for example, intravenous IVs, intravenous feeding, intravenous medicines, which used to be, maybe in the 50s and 60s, extraordinary means, now they're not. They're very ordinary means. So Catholics and all people are obliged to, to provide for a dying person all the necessary means, especially feeding them by medicines and by uh, the, the feeding by the tube. Man is obliged to use prudent means in order to preserve his health 
and the health of those under his care. So, what does the fifth commandment forbid? The fifth, com fifth commandment forbids this long list. Here it is. Murder, obviously including abortion, which is a direct crime. And we have now even many uh, priests in the, in, since Vatican II, even bishops, who have weakened and softened on this point of abortion. And now some of them even say it's a woman's right. And that, that's against the fifth commandment. Murder, suicide, fighting, anger, hatred, revenge, drunkenness, bad example, or scandal. So let's look uh, closely at a couple of these. The life of another person may lawfully be taken. So when is murder permitted? It's never allowed except under certain circumstances. Let's see what the church teaches. First, in order to protect one's own life, self-defense. Someone's breaking into your house with a rifle and you have your wife and children at home. You may use a gun to protect your family and yourself. That is permitted by common sense, by the natural law. So, um, also, in order to protect one's life or that of a neighbor, or a serious amount of possessions from an unjust aggressor, provided no other means of protection is effective. So, self-defense and uh, defending a neighbor as well. So if a Muslim comes up to a, a, a person and threatens their life in the store, you have every right to defend them. And if the Muslim pulls out a gun on them to shoot them, you can shoot the Muslim to protect that person. So that's called uh, defense, self-defense, uh, from an unjust aggressor. Secondly, uh, uh, by a soldier fighting in a just war. A soldier fighting in a just war, he's commanded by his generals, got to shoot the enemy, he may do so in a just war. Uh, the question of war, that's a real sticky one with the modern wars and modern means of war, but the basic guidelines are um, it must be just, it must not be excessive. One must not become bloodthirsty in war and kill more than necessary, such as innocent civilians. Third, by a duly appointed executioner of the state, when he meets out a just punishment for a crime. So this brings us to a, an interesting question because we see since Vatican II, many Catholic bishops and priests <coughs> teach that capital punishment is sinful, that it's an evil. But let's look what the Catholic Church has always taught in her tradition. Firstly, based on the natural law, St. Thomas Aquinas says, the good of the whole uh, takes precedence over the part. His example is this, if I got a hand that's, that has a wound and my hand gets gangrene and infected, the doctors are going to do what? They're going to amputate the hand, why? To save the rest of the body, because it's going to move up the arm into the heart and kill the whole, the whole body. So capital punishment for the good of the whole of society, the state has the right by God's authority. And St. Paul defends this and says that the, the arm of justice of the state may mete out punishment. And the church, uh, our Christ himself, speaks about capital punishment when he says, better than a millstone be tied around the neck and someone drowned in the sea by the lawful state, after someone has been accused of, of, a, of a crime, of a serious crime, after a fair trial, let him be drowned, our Lord says, to the bottom of the sea. So the state does have this right, but always, always, in a, after a fair trial, and they can, they, no one has the right to kill an innocent person, but if they're found guilty, the hand that is dangerous to the whole must be cut off. So St. Thomas says a criminal, whether he be the worst of criminals, which, which is heretics, 
But we've lost all this now. Heresy is the worst her error, the worst crime. And then murderers, and then uh, thieves, and uh, uh, child molesters, and predators, and pedophiles, and uh, those who promote homosexuality, these all fit in being worthy of capital punishment in normal times and in common sense and in Catholic teaching. So such a person after a fair trial may be condemned to death. Now to modern sentimentality, this sounds uh, unjust and unfair, but listen, listen to some of these things from, and take this from Iota Unum, Rom Romano Amerio, which was a book praised by Archbishop Lefebvre. Death, which has the highest expiatory po value possible among natural things, precisely because life is the highest good. What's the highest good we all have? Is to be alive. So, among all the natural things, we value our life, precisely because life is the highest good among the relative goods of this world. And it is by consenting to sacrifice that life that the fullest expiation can be made for a crime. So St. Thomas and, and uh, Professor Amerio is defending that not only is capital punishment good for society because it, get rid, it gets rid of a threat to society. How would you like to live in a neighborhood where you know there's a, a, a mass murderer who lives down the street and the police do nothing about it? And he's already murdered your neighbor across the street. You're going to live in peace? Are you going to keep your doors open? Are you going to keep your children? Are you going to let them run around at night? Of course not. So it's for the good of society, capital punishment, but also the church teaches, quoting St. Thomas Aquinas, it's good for the criminal himself. We'll see why. How is this? Again, the expiation that the innocent Christ made for the sins of mankind was itself affected through his being condemned to death. So Christ was never guilty of any crime, but he died for the innocent. But a criminal who's justly put to death by the state after a fair trial, he may offer his death to the love of God and expiate all his sins and even save his soul. And even, says St. Thomas, if his dispositions are correct before God, he can go straight to heaven. Listen to this. Remember to the conversions of condemned men at the hands of St. Joseph Cafasso. St. Joseph Cafasso, who was the confessor to, uh, to St. John Bosco, he would often accompany the criminals to the execution. They were hanged. But also some of the letters of people condemned to death in the resistance. That was a, a resistance in France at the time. Thanks to the ministry of the priest stepping in between the judge and the executioner, the death penalty has often excuse me, brought about some famous conversions, such as Felice Robal, who was assisted to the scaffold by Antonio Rosmini, or Martin Marino, who tried to kill the Queen of Spain in 1852, and uh, conversions such as Niccolo di Tuldo, who was comforted right at the scaffold by St. Catherine of Siena herself. She would, she would accompany many of the condemned. And also uh, Jacques Fesch, guillotined in 1957, whose letters from prisons are a moving testimony to the spiritual perfection of one of God's elect. And then St. Thomas says these very words about the expiation for a criminal who's condemned to death justly, after a fair trial always. Here's what he says from the Summa of Theology, St. Thomas. Even death inflicted as a punishment for crimes, taken away, takes, does take away the whole punishment due for those crimes in the next life, or at least part of that punishment. According to the quantities of guilt, resignation, and contrition, but a natural death does not expiate the same way. So, uh, so St. Thomas says capital punishment saves society as a whole, and it can be good for the criminal because he converts, he makes a good confession, 
And remember the great story of St. Teresa of the child Jesus. At nine years old, she prayed for this criminal who was going to be executed. Our Lord heard the prayer of this nine-year-old girl. And the priest was there. And uh, the condemned criminal said to the chaplain, Father, give me that crucifix. And he made his confession at the scaffold, and he was executed. So capital punishment, which all the modernists hate, but it, it has, just think, just think, if I was a criminal and I'm going to murder my next door neighbor because I want his car, but I know that if I get caught, I'm going to be shot at dawn after a fair trial, I'm going to think twice about it. And with capital punishment, the crime rate goes way down. And now a lot of people's taxes are going to support these criminals in the prisons to give them a good life with three meals a day. And uh, they're released after 15 years, and they go, many of them go back to their crimes. So we also have a great quote from Pope Pius XII. On September 14th, 1952, listen to this. Even when it is a question of someone condemned to death, the state does not dispose of an individual's right to life. It is then the task of public authority to deprive the condemned man of the good of life in expiation of his fault, after he has already deprived himself of the right to life by his crime. So you see what Pope Pius XII he teaches what the church has always taught. And that is, by a criminal murdering or doing something worthy of death that is very serious and threatens the common good of the people, such a person deserves to lose the right to life after a fair trial. So, so teaches Pope Pius XII. Of course, the modernists can't stand him and all the previous popes before him, but that's the clear teaching of the church. So capital punishment, uh, in spite of all the liberals and sentimentalists, it is for the good of society. And anyone with common sense and a little bit of faith can see this. And, and, one, and one even finds in the Roman law, the Roman law um, has capital punishment. And they were pagans. So, so uh, another question, what about war? I'm not going to go too deep into the question because it's very intricate and it takes a lot of distinction. But basically it has to be a just war. The war is an armed conflict between sovereign states which is undertaken by public sanction. A nation may wage a just war under the following four conditions. First, it, if it is necessary to defend the rights of the state in a grave matter. So if, if, a, if a country is attacked, you may defend it. The soldiers may fight to defend it. And I say the soldiers, that is the men. It is absolute perversity and it's wrong to put the girls in the front lines. Every soldier knows it's a joke. All the men know it's wrong. But the liberals push this nonsense. And what happens is the girls, many of them, they're not made for this kind of combat. They're not built for it. So they crumble, the men go to save their lives, and they get shot. So it's, it's part of that liberal stupidity. And then putting all the girls in the boot camps with Marines and Army, it's a total joke. And any sane man knows this. So it's, it's the, the men defend the state when it's under attack, the country. Second, if it is undertaken only as a last resort after all other means have failed. Third, if it is conducted justly in accordance with natural and international law. Fourth, if it is not continued after due satisfaction has been offered or given by the unjust aggressor nation. So you're not allowed to kill more than necessary. But uh, most modern wars break all these rules of a just war. What about the direct intention to kill an innocent person? This is never permissible either by public or private authority. So an innocent person, the state cannot put to death, nor a private individual. 
the state does not have the right to take the life of a sick person. So this goes for the old and for the retarded, for the mentally challenged, they say now, for the retarded people. And uh, the state, many states who were pagan and atheist, such as the communists, put to death these people, use them for scientific experiment. And that's, it's, it's, it's totally immoral. Even at their own request, the, so assisted suicide, which has now been passed in Canada and is being passed in some states in the United States, this is totally immoral. If a patient asks for a shot to kill them, you cannot do it. It's absolutely immoral, assisted suicide. In order to relieve him from pain as well, if he's in great pain, you cannot take him out of his pain. But you can ask him, offer it with Christ on the cross, offer it for souls, offer it in reparation for your sins. An, an unborn child has the same right to life as any other person and may never be directly killed even to save the life of the mother. So if a, if a mother is giving birth to a baby, it's not going smoothly. The mother is bleeding excessively. Can the doctor kill the mother to save the baby? Or can the doctor kill the baby to save the mother? The church says, in natural law, and God's law says, you cannot commit murder. You cannot commit murder. You have to leave it in God's hands. You cannot kill the child to save the mother. You cannot kill the mother to save the child. You have to try to sustain the life of both. And if God takes one of them, that's His will. But it's immoral, and this is something now Catholic bishops are promoting, to save the life of the mother and kill the child. And that's not right. It's completely immoral and against the fifth commandment. So, um, an unborn child cannot be killed to save a mother. E. The human body may not be mutilated unless there is no other way to preserve the health or to save the life of a person. All right? F. If it is sinful, is it sinful to risk one's life without a sufficient good reason? Yes, it is. If you don't have a reason serious enough to risk your life, you're not allowed to do that. To risk one's life in order to save the life of another person, however, someone's drowning, you don't know how to drip, swim that well, but you go in to save them, you can do that. And if you don't know how to swim and you're going to drown, but you help save that person, that's a, a great act of charity in God's eyes. So, it, so it's not considered uh, suicide in that case, because you're helping to save another. And Christ himself teaches that. He who lays down his life for uh, his friend, there's no greater love. So it is permissible, and in certain cases obligatory, to, to risk your life, such as firemen to, to rescue a family in a house that's burning or in a car. Uh, a priest is bound, a parish priest is bound to risk his life to bring the sacraments to his parishioners. That means a risk of life, even if the person has a, a contagious disease, and it's eating all of all his skin and it leads to death, the priest still has to go and anoint him and hear his confession. What about uh, cases like um, suicide? It is the law of the church that the bodies of those who have knowingly and deliberately committed suicide shall not be given Christian burial. Of course, Vatican II overthrew all this. But the church always did this because people will see, well, I better not commit suicide. I'm not going to have Catholic burial. People won't pray for me. And St. Thomas gives three reasons uh, why suicide is a threefold evil. One, it's a lack of moral fortitude. Everybody has their hard times. Everybody has their low points. And the devil does say, you know, why don't you just take your life? But God gave us the means to resist that. Pray. Ask, you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be open to you. We have a Father in heaven who loves you and died, sent his own son to die for us. And as a, as a heavenly mother also, the Virgin Mary, she's our mother in heaven. So we have all this 
all our friends in heaven and the saints to pull us out and uh, good people on earth, whether it be family, priests, nuns, who, who can help people pull out of this. But it's a lack of moral fortitude. And that's why it's important, uh, you know, in raising children, the knocks of the playground and the bruises and the cuts, that all forms their character. So we shouldn't make life over soft for them. That's, uh, suicide is also an injustice, firstly to him, the person himself, because he has no right to take his life. God alone sets that hour. And none of us are allowed to say, well, I'm going to take my life because I, I, I'm having a headache today, or everything's falling apart. No. God, who allows many times the valleys, he also creates the mountains. He who makes rainy days also has sunny days. So you must trust in God and bear patiently the crosses of this life. Uh, suicide is also an injustice against society. And this is what, one thing many of them don't think about. When, a, when someone takes their life, the whole family suffers. The brothers and sisters wonder why. Maybe it's my fault. What did I do? And the, those he works for, they needed his work. And, there, and his, his virtues and his gifts that he gave for the good of his family, society, his workplace, he deprives them of that. It's, a, it's an injustice against society. So says St. Thomas. And uh, Venerable Anne Catherine, Be Blessed Mary of Agreda, she says that Judas, his body as well as his soul, are in hell, who committed suicide. Third, obviously, and the most serious reason, it's an offense against God, suicide. It's never lawful to commit suicide. Never. Also, what about a duel? Uh, the old cowboy movies, well, it's fine in the movies. Walk, walk ten steps, turn around and shoot them. It's fine in Hollywood, but in real life, it's forbidden. It's a nice communication to encourage, participate, and... Uh, actively promote a duel. The church punishes with excommunication not only those who engage in a duel, but also those who assist them. Unjust anger. What about unjust anger? This leads to hatred, revenge, fighting, and other grave sins. So anger falls under the fifth commandment. Because a slight anger can be venial sin, but a full consented hatred of another is a mortal sin. To wish someone dead in their heart is a mortal sin. Excessive eating and drinking are sinful because they injure the health of a person and often lead to other sins. A person commits a mortal sin when by excessive use of alcoholic drink, he deliberately deprives himself of the use of reason without a just cause, or when by habitual drinking he seriously injures his health such as the liver, neglects to provide for his family, spending all the money for his wife and children on his, himself in the bar, or gives scandal, or when as a result of excessive drinking he violates a grave obligation arising from the law of God, the church, or the state. So, for example, the, the state is right to, to crack down on DWI, drunk driving while intoxicated, because such a person puts many other people in danger. And this happened actually in 1988 in May on uh, Highway 71 between Louisville and Cincinnati here in Kentucky. There's the famous crash of a drunk driver hitting a bus head on. The bus was full of children. The bus was torqued. They couldn't get out from the windows. They couldn't get out at all. It caught fire. And all those children, uh, most of them burnt to death. So, um, Drunkenness is uh, mortally sinful. So here's some quotes from the sacred scripture. Our Lord mentions this. Um, using harsh words of hate, calling our neighbor a raka or fool. These are sins worse than murder in some cases. The, the Saint Paul says, chapter 5 of Galatians, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are enmities, contentions, anger, quarrels, murders, drunkenness, carousings, and such like. And concerning these I warn you, as I have warned you before, 
And they who do such things will not attain the kingdom of God. And, our, and St. John, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So what are we commanded by the fifth commandment? A decent, take care of oneself, reasonably so, spiritual things first, and take care of the good of our neighbor. And who's our neighbor? Christ said, anyone who we stumble across who needs our help. And that help goes physically as well as spiritually. Spiritually as well as physically. So the corporal works of mercy, feed the hungry, give thirst to the, drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, give a place of hospitality to those who have no home. God re uh, uh, rewards this as done to himself. But the higher ones are the spiritual works of mercy, remember that, to counsel the doubtful. So give good readings, give good websites, tell them about uh, 469 Fitter, they can have catechisms, they can hear the sermons of the Catholic faith, and the, about the crisis of the faith we're in now, the fight for a Catholic tradition, and the reign of Christ the King, and the stand of Archbishop Lefebvre. So these are all great works of mercy, to pray for the living and the dead, People forget this. To pray for the souls in purgatory is a great work of mercy. And they really appreciate it. So that concludes the fifth commandment. Next class will be the sixth commandment. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, crusher of all heresies, pray for us. Our Lady Crusher of Modernism, pray for us. St. James, Slayer of the Muslims, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.